Good morning, good morning. So nice to see all of you today. I hope you enjoyed the 14 raindrops we got. <laughs> and let's pray for more rain because we desperately need it. Before the first service, a gentleman came up to me and he said, now do you have a sermon today that will keep me awake? I said, man, I'm not a miracle worker. And uh, I don't know what happened. I was afraid to look in his direction this morning. But I said, look, just enjoy your nap. But, but not too loudly. After the service, a fellow came up to me and he said, oh, he said, I like your voice. It puts me right to sleep, he said. <laughs> I got to work on that voice thing. People see me walking around with the mic headset on and uh, I don't know why, what's puzzling about it, but they say, are, are you preaching today? I said, no, I just like walking around with this on, you know, this monstrosity wrapped around me. But then I say, yeah, I'm preaching today. Now, but please stay, okay? Don't leave. Stay. I'm a little nervous about that because two weeks ago, a fellow said, are you preaching today? And I said, no. They said, oh, we're going to stay then. <laughs> so many dear friends. <laughs> Cruel, but dear Happy my nephew is here today. Uh, where are you guys sitting? Carolyn and right over here, my nephew, uh, Caleb. Caleb is the middle son of uh, Carolyn's youngest brother. They have, and her youngest brother lives in Sioux City. Caleb lives in Chicago, and he's back for the weekend and delighted that he could be with us today. And Caleb is 26 years old, and he is single. <laughs> and uh, ladies, he will be conducting interviews right after the service. <laughs> He's a really nice guy. He's a lot of fun and gainfully employed, I might add. <laughs> and I will always be remembered as the uncle who caused him no small embarrassment. It's just what I do. <laughs> well, I want to talk to you today about prayer, and I think we ought to talk about prayer. Because every spiritual inclination, every spiritual endeavor is constantly under attack. The world, the flesh, and the devil speak lies to us. And when it comes to prayer, we hear their voices telling us that, well, prayer is a joke. You can't be serious. Prayer is a waste of time. Prayer is a, a futile and foolish endeavor. Intelligent people, sophisticated people, don't waste their time praying. You ever heard those kinds of voices? Well, I don't take my cues regarding spiritual matters or spiritual truth from cynics. I don't take them from people who don't know what they're talking about any more than I would, I would, offering them technical assistance on their iPhone. My text this morning is James chapter 5. If you would, join me by looking at the overhead or in your Bibles, James chapter 5, Verse 13, I want you to notice all the words are important. I've underlined so many in this text. Is any one of you in trouble? I've underlined the word trouble because it seems to be most of us quite familiar with trouble. He should pray. Is anyone happy? Well, let him sing songs of praise. Is any one of you sick? He should call the elders of the church to pray over him and anoint him with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer offered in faith will make the sick person well. The Lord will raise him up. If he has sinned, he will be forgiven. Therefore, confess your sins to each other and pray for each other so that you may be healed. The prayer of a righteous man is powerful 
and effective. Elijah was a man just like us. He prayed earnestly that it would not rain, and it did not rain on the land for three and a half years. And he prayed again, and the heavens gave rain, and the earth produced its crops. Now, I've preached on this text many times. I guess at my age, I've preached on many texts many times. But I want to take a fresh look at it today. This is an old oven, but it offers fresh bread. And I, uh, I see three encouragements to prayer from this text. First of all, I am encouraged by the person who writes these words and the legacy of that person. James is a man worth knowing, like the farmer's insurance man says, we know a thing or two because we've seen a thing or two. James has been around. He's seen a lot, and it's impossible to encapsulate his life in a few chosen words, but let me highlight his life by three different words. First of all, I would characterize James' life with the word Jew, because you can't get more Jewish than James was. He was a Messianic Jew, writing to fellow Jewish Christians. Chapter 1, verse 1, he says to the 12 tribes scattered among the nations, that Old Testament terminology for the people of Israel. In chapter 2, verse 21, he makes mention of our ancestor, Abraham. So it reminds us that the womb of Christianity is Judaism. A second word I would use to describe James' life and ministry is the word Jesus. You see, James was Jesus' brother, half-brother. They had the same mother. For a long time, James had real difficulty wrapping his mind around the notion that Jesus was more than human, that Jesus was divine, but that all changed at the resurrection. And after that, there was no question. And James introduces himself in the first words of this letter, not as James, the brother of Jesus, but as James, a servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ. And in chapter 2, he refers to him as our glorious Lord, Jesus Christ. In fact, James becomes writer, pastor, and even martyr, dying for the Christian faith and the gospel of Jesus Christ. And that leads us to the third word I would use to present James. And that's the word Jerusalem. Because, you see, James pastored the church in Jerusalem. He is a prominent figure in the church as a whole. He's an influencer in Acts chapter 15 when, when the church has their counsel uh, regarding the issue of grace versus works. And James gets the last word in the discussion, and grace wins out. I'm happy to say, and it's not even close. Now, that church in Jerusalem had an interesting history with prayer. You might recall the story. Another James had been beheaded by King Herod, and Herod saw his poll numbers go up, so he then arrested Peter, who faced the same inevitable fate and Peter was put in prison. But then we are provided with this bit of information because this bit of information will determine destinies. It will trump the king's edict. It will go on record to inspire God's people down through the ages. We are simply told in Acts chapter 12 and verse 5 
that Peter was kept in prison, but the church was earnestly praying to God for him. Now, this is a problem for those who don't believe in prayer, for those who insist that prayer is a waste of time, because the linkage is evident when the church prayed, God sent an angel. And that's what prayer does. Prayer just opens the doors of possibilities to angels and miracles, the supernatural. God sent an angel in direct response to the prayers of the church to break Peter out of prison. And then Peter shows up at the prayer meeting to let everybody there know that their prayers have been answered. How nice of him. You say, but I, I, all that's just a coincidence. Yeah. Somebody said, the more I pray, the more coincidences I have. <laughs> so this is the background and the legacy of this man, James. He writes about prayer because he's seen firsthand how it works. He writes about it because he knows how it's impacted his life and the life of his church. So I am encouraged to pray by the person writing. Secondly, I'm encouraged to pray by the people to whom he is speaking. James is very articulate, very concise, very direct, very clear. James was inclusive before inclusive was a big deal. James was way ahead of us. It's amazing how often you see Jesus so far ahead of us and the Apostle Paul so far ahead of us and James far ahead of us. He was so inclusive. Notice how often he references anyone. That's a very inclusive term, isn't it? In verse 13, is any one of you in trouble? Is any one happy? Verse 14, is any one of you sick? And in similar fashion, in verse 16, pray for each other. There's an inclusiveness here that is most reassuring. There are no class distinctions in the body of Christ. None. A gentleman shared with me that he was discouraged and confused and frustrated. He was wondering why his prayers weren't answered, like Kenneth Copeland's and Jesse Duplantis and those other guys and gals on Christian television wondering why he didn't have the health and the wealth that they had, and, and he was feeling condemned because he didn't. I had to tell him that, you know, they, these people you're talking about, they had problems too, believe it or not. Yeah, they get sick too, regardless of their theology and their positive confession and their TV persona. You just don't hear about it. They can't afford for you to know about it. And then I confidently told him that God cared for him just as much as he, did, as he did any of those people. Yes, even those people who are on television, who live in mansions, who drive Roy's Royces while you're driving along in your beat-up Ford struggling to pay your property taxes. I don't know if he believed me. I hope he did. I know I believe me. Good preaching, Pastor. James says, any of you, any of you, anyone, each one. And then he gets even more particular. And he references a broad spectrum of specific people so there could be no mistake about it. Who are you talking to, James? Well, first of all, he says, I'm talking to those who are in trouble. Verse 13, any one of you in trouble? I got a message for you. Are you in trouble today? Some of you feel like you live in Trouble City. 
Trouble knows your address. Trouble knows your name. Trouble never goes away for very long. God cares for troubled people. He cares about you. He cares about the trouble you are in. He won't abandon you in your trouble. You said, but it was my own stupid mistakes. God loves stupid people too. God is our helper. The kind of trouble is not specified here because it's all kinds of trouble. The Greek word, by the way, for trouble, I find it fascinating, is the word from which we get our English word, pathetic. Did you ever feel that way? Well, that is just pathetic. Been there. Done that. Sometimes when we get into trouble, it's easy for us to interpret that as a sign that God doesn't care. James is saying, if you're in trouble, pray, because God does care. Then he identifies the happy in verse 13. If you're happy, praise the Lord for it, he says. Return that happiness in God, to God in thanksgiving. Why? Because prayer is the best way to remind yourself it is due to the goodness and the kindness of God that you can enjoy that chapter of personal happiness. The psalmist said, acknowledge the Lord in all your ways, in the good times and in the bad. Then James reaches out to the sick. In fact, he dedicates the most space to the sick person. Look what he says in verse 14. Is any one of you sick? He should call the elders of the church to pray over him and anoint him with oil in the name of the Lord, and the prayer offered in faith will make the sick person well. The Lord will raise him up. James is quick, clear, and careful to connect the sick with the body of Christ through the elders or the leaders of the church. I think James does that because so many times, dear friends, sickness uh, can alienate and isolate. Sickness can put up a barrier between the sick and the healthy, and it makes us feel so alone. What a picture of a loving and caring community, wrapping itself, wrapping its arms, giving its hearts to the sick. I say that in the light of what I see going around so often today. I have heard of people afflicted with illnesses, feeling isolated and demeaned and condemned in certain faith circles and faith churches, looked upon with suspicion because they were sick. And believe it or not, I've even uh, heard of those who've been asked to leave a church because their sickness did not reflect well on the image that the church wanted for itself. That is, an, that is an example of a church being exactly the opposite of what a church is supposed to be. In my opinion, that is a church and church leaders that are mean and ignorant and dangerous. And someday, I'll tell you what I really think. <laughs> when I get a little closer to retirement. <laughs> Any of you sick? Provide the sick a loving environment of prayer. Call the elders to pray. Have the church pray. Put loving hands on them and pray. And then he includes the one who has sinned. And I'm so glad he did. In verse 15, the latter part of the verse, if he has sinned, he will be forgiven. Therefore, confess your sins to each other and pray for each other so that you may be healed. The prayer of a righteous man is powerful and effective. If the church is anything, 
It's a healing place. The church is a saving place. The church is about praying and loving and accepting and healing and forgiving. The church is the good news place. The church is where the Lord shows up and does what only the Lord can do. The church is the place where the troubled get help, where the happy get happier, where the sick get healing, where the sinner finds forgiveness and restoration. We don't judge the sick, and we don't judge the sinner. And if we do, we're sick, and we're sinful. We pray for them, we pray over them, and we pray with them, and healing and forgiveness comes, not because they deserve it, not because we deserve it, but because the one to whom we pray is mighty and merciful, and he hears us, and he cares about us, and he sends us his answer, just like he did for Elijah. That leads us to our third encouragement in prayer. First, the person who's written these words. Secondly, the people to whom he has written them. And thirdly, the promise that he has written. This robust and reassuring promise James gives us in that latter portion of verse 16, the prayer of a righteous man is powerful and it is effective. You say, well, preacher, that just sounds absolutely wonderful. But I got a couple of problems with it. Yeah, I know you do. That's, that's why I'm here. That's why I'm talking about it. I have the same problem. This verse talks about answered prayer, preacher. But man, I've, I've got a whole bunch of unanswered prayers. And if our prayers are powerful and effective, why aren't my prayers answered? Well, I hear you, and that's, that's a very good question. And I, I know it's one that we've all asked. I know I, I, I have. I, I'm a member of that club. Sometimes our prayers are answered. It's a hallelujah happening when that takes place. Sometimes our prayers are answered in a way we didn't expect. It may take us a while to figure that one out and to kind of wrap our minds around it. Sometimes instead of lifting the burden, God gives us strength to carry it. Hello. Sometimes instead of making it go away, He makes a way. Sometimes instead of giving us what we want, He gives us what we need. Sometimes instead of fixing it, He may be working to fix us. Sometimes God says yes, sometimes God says no, sometimes God says wait, sometimes I can't figure out what he's saying. I have no clue. There are mysteries locked away, shrouded in the sovereignty of God. We don't have all the answers. None of us do. But we know enough, we know enough, we know enough to keep on keeping on. We know God is good all the time. We know God is never careless or capricious. The Bible says, now we see through a glass darkly. Now we pray with limited uh, wisdom, but God answers with his omniscient wisdom. Now we pray with a human's short-sightedness because that's what humans do. God, who knows the end from the beginning, answers with an eternal, eternal perspective. You know, I've seen people get mad at God. I've seen it a lot. I I never understand it. Uh, And I'm not wanting to be harsh in making that observation. I feel sorry for them when that happens because how futile to get mad at God and hold a grudge against Him sometime for years. 
sometimes for a lifetime. Because he didn't answer their prayer, because he didn't give them what they wanted, when they wanted it, and how they wanted it. I think we need to understand that even unanswered prayer, unanswered from our perspective, is meant to accomplish God's purposes in our lives. Meant to teach us some things if we will allow it. Meant to help us learn and grow. Now think about it. If all our prayers were answered 100% of the time, the way we wanted, Who'd be running the universe? We would. And my friend, that is a scary proposition. Hey, I like you, and, and I know you bring some impressive skills to the table, but I don't want you running the universe, and you don't want me running the universe either. Yes, thank you, Pastor. <laughs> That's your job. <laughs> so what do we do with our unanswered prayers? Well, we leave them with God because we know that God can be trusted. We, we, we pull off a job. The Lord giveth, and the Lord taketh away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Trust Him on the mountaintop and in the valley. Trust Him under the glorious, brilliant sunshine. Trust Him when it's so dark. Trust Him when you know what He's doing. Trust Him when you don't have a clue. All right, preacher, that helps a little. But I got another problem here. It's in that word righteous. You see, preacher, the text talks about the righteous man says, verse 16, the prayer of a righteous man availeth much. And the truth is, preacher, I don't feel very righteous. And quite honestly, there are times when I, I don't live righteously. I get in my own way. I'm my own worst enemy. And I'm looking in the text here for some kind of escape route, some kind of exception, but all I get is James presenting to me this incredible example of righteousness, a prophet, one of the greatest prophets that ever lived, Elijah, who saw some of the greatest miracles in history. Listen, my friend, believe it or not, Elijah had some issues. There were times he needed Dr. Phil and Dr. Oz on the same day. He was depressed and self-absorbed and even suicidal. He wasn't perfect. No one is. Not even the righteous. So James thoughtfully, tenderly adds he was a man just like us. Pastor, remember what the coach always said before the big game when the team might have been a little intimidated by the prospect of what they faced out there on that court? How many times did I hear a coach say, boys, they put their pants on one leg at a time just like you? And what they were trying to say is that they're just like you. And that's what James says about Elijah, just like you. So let me help you a little bit with righteous. None of us are. End of discussion. None of us are righteous in ourselves. The Bible makes that unmistakably clear. It says our righteousness is as filthy rags. Ditch it. Throw it away. But every child of God, every believer, every follower of Christ is declared righteous with a right standing every one of us has been given an imputed righteousness 
We had none in our account. We were morally bankrupt, but God deposited the righteousness of his perfect sinless son into our account, and there's enough righteousness in him to cover all of us. So, when James says, the prayer of a righteous man availeth much, guess who he's talking about? He's talking about you and me and every believer. So this promise is ours. So pray. Pray big. Pray boldly. Trust God. And then pray again. And if you need prayer today, I'm going to ask you to come, just like the Bible says, to come. And after you have come, we're going to ask our pastoral staff and our elders, deacons, and our prayer team members to come as well. We're going to pray with you. We're going to pray for you today. We're going to surround you with an atmosphere of faith and love. And I don't know how, I don't know how that could ever be anything less than beautiful and powerful. Would you stand with me? And if you need prayer today, as our worship team is coming, would you come this morning? You don't need the mood music to respond. You just come in obedience. You say, well, you know, I don't feel it, man. I don't feel it. Well, let me show you what feeling has to do with anything. You see that? Not even that. Feeling has absolutely nothing to do with our responses to the Lord, with our service for the Lord, with our love for the Lord. Feeling has nothing to do with our faith. Absolutely nothing. And if you want to govern your, your spiritual life by feeling, you have set yourself up for frustration and despair guaranteed again and again. Shake loose from the concept of a feeling-driven Christian life. Today we operate not by feeling, but by faith. That's all, faith. That's the catalyst. That's the key word. That's the fulcrum, faith. You got enough faith to come and say, Lord, here I am. And I'm exercising the faith you've given me. God never said, God never said, you got to have faith like a mountain to move a mustard seed. God said, you got to have faith like a mustard seed. And with faith like a mustard seed, you can blow a mountain aside. Faith like a mustard seed, that's all. Lord, here I am, and I'm, I'm just going on record with you. I'm telling you, Lord, I'm committing my need to you. I'm trusting you today, Lord. That's what this is about, trusting you. I want to trust you today, Lord.